I think slightly this way. Yeah, that's enough. So can you hear me? Of course I can, yes. And can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, sir, your voice is not audible. Oh. Can you hear my voice? Uh, uh, sir, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, fine, sir. I think now it's perfectly fine. Uh, so, so sir, welcome to... Uh, welcome to Zakir Hussain College. And in fact, we have Professor Geeta Dharampal also with us. We have joined. And so can we'll you, start. Can you hear me as well? Um, Do Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Professor Geeta Dharampal, uh, we can hear you, ma'am. Uh, uh, glad to see you and both. And you uh, uh, see. Very good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very good. In Excellent. fact, despite the technical glitches, we are able to <laughs> uh, join through this proceeding. Yeah, this is so really a, a historic yeah. moment. It's wonderful yeah. to Professor yeah. Parikh, yes. Yeah, right. we, will, right. we, are, we will begin in two minutes because our technical team is uh, going to uh, start this event uh, on, on Facebook and YouTube also. So they are just working. Maybe in one minute we will start uh, the proceedings. Okay, <clears throat> just one minute. Can you stay for about two, three minutes? Yeah, right, let's start. Okay. <laughs> Are they waiting for us or any problem at the other end? No, they're waiting, they're waiting for the technicians to set up the um the Facebook stream so that it's gonna be broadcast live on the on Facebook. I didn't know you could do that I spoke to Sorry? I didn't know you could do that to link link Facebook to Zoom, but I suppose it's not surprising. All of these different systems are gradually starting to work together. Mm. But the one that suits us best is Zoom. Well, it's, it's the most accessible. The, the, the WebEx one has always been problematical. I, <clears throat> I don't know why. Maybe Google Meet. Google Meet. Google Meet. Sorry? Google Meet. Google Meet. Yeah, that would have been okay. That's, that was, you used that without any problem, didn't you? Hmm? You, you, you had it a couple of times. Yeah. Google Meet. Google, Google Meet to Zoom. It's possible that WebEx, I don't know who runs WebEx, uh, but it's possible that it uses more bandwidth for some reason. I don't know why that would be the case. You, you've tried WebEx three times and you've had problems every time with WebEx. So, uh, Zoom, Zoom is the easiest. The common is. Yeah, well, it's, it's. The, the The council, the whole city council, don't use Zoom because they say it's not secure. No, it's not secure. Apparently. But, uh, Okay, I think uh, we, we will begin now because I think our technical team is ready. Uh, uh, so I welcome you all. 
to the third edition of uh, uh, Distinguished Se Lecture Series organized by Gandhi Study Circle, Zakir Hussain Delhi College. Um, uh, 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 Honorable uh, Professor Masrul Ahmed Beg, Principal Zakir Hussain Delhi College, uh, the eminent Professor Bhikkhu Parekh, uh, Professor Geeta Dharampal, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues and other students and dear students. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome you all at the third edition of the Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, uh, the idea of the Distinct Lecture Series uh, has been introduced uh, with the objective to deliberate on the Gandhi's legacy of inclusiveness uh, that underlines Gandhi's philosophy. Uh, the first two lectures, as you may know, have been delivered by Professor Akhil Bilgrami and Professor Faisal Devji. Uh, in our constant endeavor uh, to engage Gandhi's thought and praxis uh, and imparting value education, uh, Gandhi's study circle uh, during the last one decade has been actively involved uh, in organizing various events, activities ranging from workshops, seminars, uh, lectures, uh, to the interactive sessions on conflict resolution, interfaith dialogue, uh, mind and stress management, and social outreach programs on issues related to environment, uh, sanitation, and homeless children. Uh, the Charkha is painting classes uh, as a skill de development initiative uh, at bringing Gandhi close to the youth is also uh, in progress uh, since 2017. Uh, we bring you a brief snippet, uh, snippet of our uh, modest journey. Yeah, that was a brief glimpse of our journey. Um, I welcome all the eminent scholars who have joined. I could see many on the screen. Uh, so welcome all the scholars uh, joining us from outside, also from different universities in India. Uh, uh, we are also expecting our principal to join. There is some technical problem because of which he is unable to uh, reach us. To uh, reach us, uh, but uh, then we will begin the proceedings now, and of course uh, we will welcome him uh, during the course of uh, this program. Uh, 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 we are extremely honored uh, uh, and fortunate to have amongst us uh, two very distinct scholars uh, whose life and works uh, have been a great source of inspiration uh, to all of us. Uh, Professor Geeta Dharampal, uh, who will chair the important session today, is currently the Dean of Research, uh, Gandhi Research Foundation, Jalgaon. Earlier, she worked as the head of the Department of History at the South Asian University at the University of Heidelberg, Germany. 
her publication and research focus on topics uh, ranging from uh, pre-modern uh, transcultural interactions between Europe and India, medi medieval history, the socio-cultural and political history of the colonial period, uh, on Mahatma Gandhi's uh, movement of political and cultural uh, resurgence. Uh, she has held uh, visiting fellowships and professorships at various international reputed institutions, among others at uh, Stanford University, USA, as well as at Indian universities at Delhi, Kolkata, and Hyderabad. Uh, Professor Bhikkhu Parekh uh, is an eminent political theorist uh, in Britain and an active member uh, of the House of Lords, as we all know. As a political scientist, his interests range uh, from contemporary concerns on ethics and violence, uh, multiculturalism, uh, collective rights and responsibilities uh, to other philosophical subjects of intellectual uh, substance. Uh, but Mahatma Gandhi, I must say, has remained a topic of special interest to him. Uh, uh, commonly addressed as Lord Viku, he has worked to bring about a, a uh, non-interventionist and tolerant political view uh, where people of different uh, persuasions and ethnicities uh, could live in peace and harmony. Uh, Professor Parekh uh, has been the author of many books uh, expressing his political uh, and philosophical standpoint uh, 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 that includes the much acclaimed uh, rethinking multiculturalism, uh, colonialism, tradition and reform, uh, Gandhi's political philosophy and the recently published work uh, by Oxford University Press on debating India essays on Indian uh, political discourse. Uh, during his lifetime, uh, Professor Parekh has been confirmed uh, with a number of awards, uh, such as the Padma Bhushan uh, by Government of India, uh, Sir Isaiah Berlin Prize, uh, Distinguished Global Thinkers Award, amongst other, by different international forums. Uh, the paucity of time uh, constrained me to speak much on the legacy of both these eminent scholars. Um, I am humbled at their presence uh, to address uh, today's webinar, uh, which is on the theme, uh, Gandhi and Swaraj in Ideas. Uh, before I request uh, the chair uh, to introduce the theme and take the proceedings forward, uh, I quickly want to make a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, participants are requested uh, to keep their audios off uh, during the uh, conduct of the proceedings. After the lecture, uh, we will have an interactive session uh, for almost for around 30 minutes. Uh, the questions, comments, and observations uh, can be shared on the chat box. Uh, we will also appreciate uh, if you come live on the screen and address your concern uh, directly to the speakers. Uh, we will also, uh, <clears throat> uh, but please be brief uh, and relevant uh, to the theme. Uh, the participants are also requested uh, to fill uh, the feedback form. Uh, now I request uh, Professor Dharampal uh, to offer her introductory remarks and conduct the session. Uh, welcome, Professor Geeta Dharampal. Thank you very much indeed. My deep appreciation to the Gandhi Study Circle and in particular to its convener, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, for inviting me to chair this very, very special webinar presided over by the principal of Zakir Hussain, Delhi College, uh, Professor Baig. Um, I feel most honored for three reasons. Not only because firstly, I am representing the Gandhi Research Foundation as a partner of the Gandhi Study Center in this initiative, but even more so because secondly, I am privileged and indeed extremely humbled to be sharing the podium albeit virtual and online, with a living legend. And I really mean that, a living legend who among his many accomplishments is also one of the preeminent Gandhian scholars of our times, namely Lord Professor Emeritus Bhikkhu Parekh, the shining star of this event as keynote speaker. Thirdly, it is because of the topic, Gandhi and Swarajin ideas, a subject that has such crucial relevance in our times and constitutes the most fortuitous way of paying homage to the continued significance of the Mahatma as a culmination to his 150th birth anniversary celebrations in India and throughout the world. 
Since I've been requested by the convener to initiate our discussion on this topic by formulating my own reflections on the theme, I shall comply with this request by tracing three aspects in a few brush strokes so that our eminent keynote speaker is inspired to paint the complete canvas. Uh, Professor Firstly, Dharampal, uh, just to, sorry to interrupt you. Can you come live uh, so that others can also view you for a while, if if you can, if it is possible? Yes, it's just that my my home <laughs> office uh, connection is rather weak, so I thought perhaps um, I would save the strength of the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, if it starts flickering, then I would uh, turn off the the video. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So um, firstly, I'll uh, say a few words on the definition and centrality of the term Swaraj in Indian public discourse. Secondly, it is of course necessary to highlight the revolutionary conception and application of Swaraj, and first and foremost of Swaraj in ideas as articulated so forcefully in Gandhi's political manifesto, Hind Swaraj. And thirdly, I'll briefly indicate what's the takeaway for us today with a promise for the future. So firstly, what is our understanding of Swaraj? In a nutshell, Swaraj, a hallowed multivalent concept with moral and spiritual connotations signifies in particular from the political science perspective, self-governing or people's democracy in the truest sense of the term and what's more, as a signifier, Swaraj is integral to the foundation of Indian polity, her praxis and ethos. As such, the concept can be traced back genealogic genealogically to Vedic antiquity. Swaraj as an idea has been imagined and reimagined and constituted a political goal to be realized even before our historic freedom struggle against the British Raj. To cite just one concrete instance, the rousing call of Hindavi Swaraj was employed as a cardinal emblem of political resurgence under Chhatrapati Shivaji in the 17th century, to be precise, as early as 1645. And two and a half centuries later, notably an Anglo-Gujarati journal called Hind Swarajya was published in the first decade of the 20th century. But this pedigree or genealogical precedent does not diminish the unique importance of Gandhi's political manifesto, Hind Swaraj, dating from 1909, that constitutes the focal point of our attention today. In addition, whilst acknowledging Gandhi's focal, uh, preeminence, we should, however, not forget, for how could we, that it was Lokmanya Tilak who popularized the concept of Swaraj about half a decade before Gandhi during the Swadeshi movement of 1905 by proclaiming, I quote, Swaraj is my birthright and I will have it. For Tilak, Swaraj meant the establishment of a democratic state in which the rights and liberties of the people were held to be sacrosanct. But for us today, whilst we are rethinking the concept of Swaraj in post-colonial India, on the eve of our celebrations of the 25th anniversary of our political independence, however deficient it may be for the majority of our population, it is nonetheless the enhanced concept of Swaraj in ideas, signaling a decolonization of the mind that has come to have an even more crucial importance than the normative political understanding of Swaraj. And now I turn to the second point, for amazingly, more than a century ago, it was Gandhi who realized the urgent need for initiating a crucial cognitive liberation or intellectual transformative e emancipation, in particular among the westernized elite of India, who were in fact the ad addressees of his dialogic treatise in Swaraj published in 1909. This view is confirmed by others, including our today's illustrious speaker, 
But it was T.K. Mahadevan, the well-known critique, who proclaimed that thanks to his to this intellectual emancipatory quality, Hind Swaraj, with its aim to bring about a Swaraj in ideas, represents a work of greater significance than Rousseau's social contract and Karl Marx's Das Kapital. For unlike these two books, Hind Swaraj did not mark the end of an age, but instead, I quote, the beginning of a new order. And given this status or its status, Gandhi's political manifesto constitutes a compelling and unsettling treatise, first and foremost, because it incisively rejects the trappings of modernity. And this at the beginning of the 20th century, at the zenith of modern civilization's accomplishments, which indeed testifies not only to Gandhi's original thinking, but also to his incredible audacity. Yet with discerning logic, Gandhi's objective, as is well known, is to intellectually counteract British colonialism's hegemonic influence over the colonized Indian elite by astutely subverting the legitimacy of the colonial enterprise at its core, namely by deconstructing its professed civilizing mission, epitomized by the Indian railways, law courts, modern medicine, and English education. In this way, Gandhi takes a first groundbreaking cognitive step on the road towards ideological liberation. Further, calling modern civilization a disease to which, according to him, the English had fallen victim, Gandhi rhetorically turns the tables on colonial discourse, which branded Indian society and environment as being diseased. Gandhi's dexterous, one could call it, exercise in intellectual acrobatics aims to shake the very foundations of the economic and political structures which were held to be sacrosanct at the time. With the intention of extricating the Indian westernized elite from the lure of modernity, Gandhi endeavors to remove its mental mesmerization vis-a-vis -vis this so-called nine days wonder, namely the flimsy modernity, which according to Gandhi had no deep-rooted foundation. So thirdly, what is the takeaway for us today? It is meant as a wake-up call. With his Swarajan ideas, Gandhi is above all intent on foregrounding the need for independence of thought and action among the Indian political strata, reinforced by integrity and commitment, qualities that are certainly in short supply in the present. Gandhi's exhortation for a Swaraj in ideas was meant to bring about an ethically grounded cognitive transformation in the Indian status quo. Significantly for him, embracing wholeheartedly one's own civilization was the first step towards attaining Swaraj, the rule of the self by the self. Yet this affirmation of one's own culture, which for him constituted part and parcel of the process of self-realization, had perforce to be accompanied by societal reform and correspondingly self-purification before real Swaraj or self-transformation could be achieved. It is Swaraj when we learn to rule ourselves, he proclaimed. For us today, this will to selfhood involves a renovation and an intellectual re-equipment of the self, whereby in Gandhi's mental landscape, intellectual and spiritual mastery and freedom of the self are one and the same, namely Swaraj. But physical and intellectual empowerment and liberation, be they collective or pertaining to the self, to Gandhi's defiant spirit also necessitated and still necessitates a, a contestatory exercise 
comprising a re radical deconstruction of stereotypical beliefs, colonial indoctrination and myth-making in order to initiate a much needed Swaraj in ideas. Unfortunately, though initiated by him, only faltering attempts in this direction have been made in the last seven and a half decades. So today, at the beginning of the second decade of the 21st century, inspired by Gandhi's example, we are called upon to engage not only in revoking the so-called imperialism of Western categories, but also in establishing a framework of indigenous conceptual categories that would reinvigorate Indian public and intellectual discourse, thereby strengthening our national well being and intellectual independence. But with this indication of an ongoing research project uh, being funded by the ICSSR, I must conclude these very preliminary reflections so that we can now be inspired by our keynote speaker, Lord Bhikkhu Parekh. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Bhikkhu Parekh, uh, uh, may I now request you to please deliver your keynote address uh, uh, after Professor Dharampal has spoken. Uh, Professor Parekh, uh, may I now request you to deliver your keynote address. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Gita Dharampan, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, authorities of the Zakir Hussain College and students. I begin by thanking the authorities of the college and Dr. Sanjeev Kumar for inviting me to deliver the lecture this evening. I'm sorry that thanks to the time difference between England and India, of five and a half hours, we are starting rather late in the day by Indian standards. Lecture beginning at six is not very usual. But I uh, is, am not to be blamed. I suppose the imperial powers are to be blamed. Because why are we five and a half hours behind? There it is. My title uh, for the lecture is Gandhi and Swaraj in Ideas. I'm not sure if Gandhi himself used the phrase. I have not been able to trace it in his writings. But it is quite close to his thought, to his thought and captures his intellectual project. He was not only the uh, only Indian leader to talk about these ideas. Many others had done so too. But they had all put different glosses on this idea and tried to solve the problem it posed in their own different ways. Gandhi's originality in talking about uh, Swaraj in ideas lay in uh, making Swaraj in ideas the touchstone of Indian national self-respect and patriotism and using the phrase Swaraj in ideas as a standard to define, to define the kind of freedom that he desired for India. Bearing this in mind, in this lecture, I want to do three things. First, I want to analyze the idea of Swaraj, because it is much misunderstood. Secondly, since the term is primarily political, that's how it began, I want to ask if it can be applied to the realm of ideas, whether Swaraj and ideas is a metaphor or is it a genuine concept. 
And thirdly, if it can be applied to the realm of ideas, not just institutions and government, what form can it take? Swaraj, after all, refers to the way in which we deal with problems of differences, the way in which we govern ourselves, and then the question is, how do we govern ideas? Or how do we deal with the ideas about governing ourselves? So these are the three questions that I want to briefly consider. The first point is, what is Swaraj? And here I think it was absolutely clear to Gandhi and many others that Swaraj is a quite different concept from independence. There are at least three ways in which the two concepts differ. First, independence is a negative concept, signifying removal of foreign rule. By contrast, Swaraj is a positive concept, indicating what a self-ruling or self-determining society should be like. How it constitutes itself into a unity how it acquires a sense of swa. That's what Swaraj is about. Second difference between the two is trivial but quite important. And that is, as Gandhi once said, Swaraj is our word, our, quote unquote, part of our language, going back to the origins of our history. By contrast, independence is a Western or a foreign concept born in a particular way of looking at the world. And we, by using the word independence, virtually give up the ambition of acquiring Swaraj in ideas. Thirdly, and this is most important, independence signifies a formal or institutional status. It implies a country in which the seat of sovereign power is located within it. Swaraj, by contrast, signifies how its citizens understand themselves and their relations, how, the way in which they arrive at the ideas and beliefs in terms of which they want to organize themselves. A country, for example, might be free of foreign rule, but its citizens might be shaped by an alien culture, a foreign culture define themselves in terms of that culture, shape their goals and ideals in terms of that culture, use a language which is, belongs to, which is natural to another culture. The Swa, the seat of Swaraj in that case, is the product of an outside agency. It is not Swaraj, it is Pararaj. So Swa here signifies that the culture, the ideas in terms of which people look at themselves are products of their own thinking, their own imagination. So these are the differences. There are many others, but I'll concentrate on just these three differences between independence and Swaraj. For Gandhi, colonialism represents the antithesis of Swaraj. Swaraj is what colonialism is not, and colonialism is what Swaraj is not. Colonialism is Pararaj, an alien culture ruling over a country, dominates it, and stealthily acquires the hegemonic control over it. Colonialism for Gandhi is primarily a cultural phenomenon, not, a, not primarily an economic phenomenon although it has economic consequences, not a political phenomenon, although it has political consequences. It's a cultural phenomenon and envelops all aspects of individual's life and thought. It shapes the way in which one looks at oneself, looks at one's own fellow citizens, formulates one's ideals, and in that sense, the culture is all pervasive. And colonialism as a cultural phenomenon implies that every aspect of an individual's thinking is shaped by a culture, which in the colonial case is external rather than thought out by people themselves. In a colonial situation, 
people think little of their past except what is indicated to them by the colonizer. The colonizer sets the norms by which they judge their own institutions. The colonizer sets the uh, models of institutions which the uh, colonized tend to imitate, imitate. And their consciousness is shaped by concept derived from the alien culture. Take something as simple as uh, religion. The colonizer asks, what is your religion? And the colonized might be puzzled and say, what do you mean by religion? And the colonizer says, the religion implies three things. The idea of a god, a prophet, and the text. And the colonized is puzzled because he can't find a single straightforward idea of God. He can't find a single prophet. There are many prophets through which the God sends himself or comes down himself. There are many texts from among which one chooses. So the poor colonized, in order to answer a simple question, what is your religion, or do you have a religion, is forced to completely misunderstand his own tradition to come up with some kind of answer that is acceptable to the colonizer. Or again, the colonizer asked, as he did in India, do you believe in one God or many? And the Indians are puzzled. And you remember the famous dialogue in Banaras between the uh, pundits and the missionaries, where the missionaries, public dialogue involving thousands of people, where the Maharaja of Banaras presided over the meeting, and the uh, uh, debate began with the uh, missionaries asking, the pundit the first question, do you believe in one God or many? To which the pundit replied, the question is illogical and blasphemous. The missionaries were completely confused. What do you mean by blasphemous? Well, it's blasphemous because you imply that God can't be both one and many. And to say that is to detract from the magnitude of, of the finite, infinite. And to say that God is one or many again is to imply that he's a being. If you say, ask, is electricity one or many? The answer to the question would look absurd. If you said, is air is one or many? The question would be absurd. Likewise, when you say, is God one or many? Supposing God is conceived as Shakti, the answer to your question would be neither. Neither one nor many. So unless the pandit stood up to the missionaries, lots of Indians kept saying, yes, do we believe in one God or many? One or many, that kind of respect. So the point that Gandhi is making is that the colonizer puzzles you, disorients you, destabilizes you by asking questions which make sense to him, but none to you at all. As Gandhi put it in a memorable sentence, Colonialism is slavery of the spirit. That's very important. Swaraj is the affirmation of the spirit. Colonialism is the slavery of the spirit. And the only coherent and full-blooded response to colonialism is Swaraj. Now Swaraj, so I move now to the uh, second part of my inquiry whether the idea of Swaraj can be applied to ideas and not just to institutions. Swaraj refers to the way in which people arrive at the ideas and beliefs in terms of which they understand and organize themselves. It requires exchange of ideas. It implies a body of ideas people can own and claim as theirs. And that's very important. That in the case of Swaraj, the ideas that you generate, the ideas by which you organize yourselves, are ideas you claim as your own and can show to be your own. And in a minute, I'll tell you what it means to claim that an idea is your own. Society for Gandhi is made up of individuals who are the moral units of society. And a society is well governed if its individual members govern themselves according to recognized norms control their desires, their demands, 
take the responsibility seriously. Otherwise, society has to be coercive and authoritarian and to control its members. Swaraj, therefore, has to be sought at two levels, both complementary. One, the collective, the other, the personal. So the next question is, how do we acquire Swaraj in ideas at the collective level or political level, and also at the individual or moral or philosophical level? At the collective level, Swaraj means living by ideas and beliefs that have grown out of one's own history and experience, and that have been filtered through a process of critical examination. These ideas and beliefs are part of, constitutive of the society's swa or identity. Self-rule is extended to the from politics to ideas. We are ruled by ideas, it is in terms of ideas that we respond to the world, we understand the world, and these ideas, the medium in terms of which we understand the world, when these ideas are ours, we talk about Swaraj in ideas. For, for Gandhi, every country has its own Swabhava, its own distinctive individuality, which it has acquired in the course of history. And this individuality or identity, what is sometimes called the soul of a country, is reflected in its beliefs and ideas. That is its truth. At the individual level, Swaran has a similar meaning. It means living by the ideas and beliefs that are part of one's history which one has critically examined and is prepared to claim as one's own. It is important in the course of arriving at a body of beliefs that one should also consider other ideas, particularly opposite ideas, and assess their strength in an open conflict. This I'll come to in a minute, but for Gandhi it's very important. That an idea is yours only, not only if you have examined it, but also if you examine its opposite and you are convinced that the idea you are accepting as your own is better or more coherent. Now these two are collective identity or collective uh, Swaraj, individual Swaraj, you might call them autonomy or personal autonomy. And you might say that Swaraj is, Gandhi, is really Gandhi's way of talking about how can a society be autonomous? How can an individual be autonomous? Some writings on Gandhi take this view. And uh, it's natural, but I think that's a serious mistake. This will liberalize Gandhi. It's a mistake in two ways. To use the word autonomy is dangerous because it has been used in so many different ways that one is not entirely clear in what sense it is being used here. In the Kantian sense, in our role sense, sense, I can think of half a dozen ways in which the term autonomy is understood. But more importantly, unlike many advocates of uh, autonomy, Gandhi argues that an individual has the duty of loyalty to the culture in which he is born. Now that's a conservative idea but an idea which Gandhi advocated all his life. And that restricts autonomy. For Mill and a lot of other people, autonomy means freely wandering over a body of ideas and picking and choosing what you consider proper. For Gandhi, it is a historically located, culturally embedded individual who is deciding through deliberation how he intends to organize his life. Now, as a member of a particular culture, an individual has an obligation of loyalty to his culture. Where does that loyalty come from? And how is it that this loyalty limits Swaraj? And I think this idea of loyalty is puzzling, puzzling to many of us. It needs to be understood with some sympathy because that which one is 
antipathetic to, has requires greater powers of comprehension. And I think when Gandhi says that one has a duty of loyalty to one's culture, you ask him why, and he will give the following four reasons. First, and this is very peculiar, uh, comes easily to a Hindu, and certainly to a Gandhi, is part of the law of karma. Gandhi says in a famous remark, if a man is born in India, there must be some reason behind the fact. Now for us, the fact that I was born in India, uh, or Gitaji was born in India and lived in Germany, these are products of individual choices or parental choices. For Gandhi, the law of karma requires, implies, that he was born in a particular country is not an accident, but is a follow, is a result of the kind of life he has lived. And then he goes on, and therefore, Remember, if a man is born in India, there must be some reason behind the fact. Then he goes on, and therefore, it implies certain special duties to that country. Right. The second reason why one has loyalty to one's culture is that the culture has nurtured you, given you a community to belong to, gives you a sense of rootedness, which leads on to the idea of Swadesha. You know, culture is Swadesha, and Swadesha is tied up with identity and with independence. Thirdly, the, as Gandhi says, deficiencies of your culture, and no culture is perfect, he freely admits it. Deficiencies of a culture can be corrected. Why give it up? To give up a culture, to change a culture in favor of another is to suggest, or is to imply, that culture is incorrigible beyond hope. And he says, but that's never the case, because you can always be changed from the ring, just as he was struggling to change the Hindu culture. Therefore, loyalty to the culture requires that you should be able to change it from the ring. And finally, the phrase very often quoted, he says, you have grown up in a particular culture, there is a fit, a match, a harmony between you and the culture. And that culture defines your dharma. And as the Bhagavad Gita says, the Gandhi was found reporting, Swadharma and Nidharam Shreya Dharma Bhayama. Swadharma, it is better to die in your dharma. Nidharam Shreya Paradharma Bhayava. Trying to follow another person's religion is disastrous. So, for all these reasons, there is an ultimate commitment to one's culture. In terms of that, with that commitment, one argues, discusses, and arrives at a body of ideas. And it's clear. And this for me explains one thing to me, at least. Gandhi was not in favor of conversion. Not just Hindus converted into Christianity, but he was also totally opposed to foreigners converting to Hinduism. When Madeline Slade found Hinduism attractive and said she wanted to be a Hindu, and he said, why do you want to become a Hindu? You can take what you like from Hinduism, but why become a Hindu? You are a Christian, stay a Christian. All his own sons, when he converted to Islam, of course, there are other reasons why he was opposed to this, but one of the important reasons simply was, look, why do you want to convert? You can take from it what you like. So for all these reasons, this basic idea that culture is not simply a fabric one picks and chooses. It's like skin. It's part of you. And therefore you have a certain ultimate loyalty to you. And loyalty doesn't imply compliance. It also implies an obligation to criticize, to dissent, to disagree. So with that kind of commitment, individuals discuss how they wish to live and arrive at different ideas. Now this idea that I, I talked about, and loyalty to culture, is strong in his early writings. He's less committed to it in his later writings. I don't want to start a new way of thinking about Gandhi saying younger Gandhi and older Gandhi, like younger Marx and older Marx, but nor is it correct to say that Gandhi was the same at the beginning as he was at the end of his life. 
he was constantly changing. And as he said, it when uh, somebody find inconsistency between two writings, then he must always respect the latter, the later writings, not the four, not the earlier ones. In his later writings, he becomes much more flexible, much more open. And then he talks, although only very vaguely about uh, loyalty to culture, then he introduces a slightly different idea. And that is the idea of intercultural dialogue, talk between cultures. And I want to say something about this, why he considered this so important. And here it must be remembered, he is not talking so much about culture as about religion. But for him, the two comes to the moral to the same thing as they do for a Hindu, where religion and culture are more or less identified, unlike in Islam or Christianity. Now, Gandhi's idea is that every culture or every religion has its strengths and has its weaknesses. Every culture represents, a limit, every religion represents a limited vision of human excellence, a limited vision of God, understanding God from a particular point of view. Now, the infinite, by definition, cannot be captured in terms of limited categories. And therefore, every religion grasps only a particular aspect of God and stretches it. So, for example, when you look at Christianity, Gandhi says, where God is Father and God is Love are central ideas. In Islam, monotheism and God is the stern judge is an important idea. Different religions grasp God differently. And around those different ideas of God, they build different rituals and institutions. Therefore, every religion is inherently limited. None of them can claim to be final or the last word of God. With the result that every religion has truth in it, but it's never true. It has truth in it, but it can't be true in the sense of fully true. Every religion has much to learn from others. And the spiritually educated person is one who is constantly learning from different religions in order to increase his understanding of the infinite. Gandhi even goes further, and that I think is an extraordinary notion, where he says when Christianity, Islam, these are all boxes that we have created. As he told Madeleine Slade, or as he told other people, I as a Hindu, if I find something attractive in Christianity, why can't I borrow it? So Gandhi borrows from Christianity. But does he become a Christian? No. That is an extremely important point, that these religions are seen very often as kind of sovereign territories which you dare not invade. And they rejected that notion is absolutely absurd. Religions are like resources. You pick up what you like, assimilate it into your way of thinking, and go on. In this process, there is no need to change. Likewise, and Gandhi borrowed so heavily from Christianity that many people said, look, he was really a Christianized Hindu. Christians said, look, you have come so far in becoming a Christian. You're a Hinduized Christian. Why don't you complete the job and get converted? And Gandhi said, why should I convert? And here you may remember a very famous incident, not often cited, is that Shankaracharya was approached. He said, Gandhi has so heavily Christianized Hinduism that he would advise the government to declare that Gandhi was not a Hindu. And there was a later campaign. So he borrowed so heavily that even the Orthodox Hindus were completely fox because they couldn't quite make up with what this man was. And some thought he was a Hindu, some thought he was a Christian, some thought he was even close to Jainism. So this idea of freely borrowing and freely moving around in the world of ideas is the one that becomes very central to him. Not only that, but there are other ideas which also become important, which we had earlier 
given less importance to. The idea of nationalism, not in the crude sense of national self-interest, but in the sense of nationality or belonging to a particular group and feeling proud of it. But going a step further, he even introduces the ideas of universal reason, of world opinion. At many points, he says, man's dignity, and nothing can be accepted if it goes against human dignity. So these universalistic notions, absent in the earlier writings, or are subdued in the earlier writings, become extremely important in his later writings. Now, Swaraj, therefore, for Gandhi, and this is an important concept, does not rule out dialogue with other religions, other cultures, doesn't rule out borrowing from others. Swar doesn't mean Swaraj, doesn't mean that Swar should have been the sole source of those ideas. The Swar alone should have generated those ideas. It means that Swar should have been an active agent involved in exploring what kind of world he or she would like to see and borrowing from others whatever Swar found valuable and constantly expanding its boundaries. Now, the only thing is when it borrowing from others, Gandhi had said, must satisfy four criteria if it is to be, uh, if it is not to be indiscriminate and thoughtless. Borrowing should not be indiscriminate and thoughtless, which is what he thought Indians were doing from the British culture, the British values, British institutions. Indiscriminate borrowing. What should borrowing be like? Why, how can it be judicious? Well, first of all, it should be a borrowing and not uncritical imitation. Borrowing is different from imitation. Secondly, it should be deliberate and conscious, not unconsciously seeping into your way of thinking. Thirdly, it should be based on a critical analysis of one's own heritage. And one should be able to look at one's own culture, show where it is faulty, why it needs to be plugged, and then borrow it. And borrow it from those who have what you don't have, an open-minded encounter with other cultures. So once these conditions are met and your borrowing is judicious, you may freely do what you need to, and that kind of borrowing or intercultural dialogue can result in one of three things. It can either result in assimilation, as Gandhi did with Christ. Let you take over an idea and it becomes a pervasive presence in your own way of thinking. So that when Gandhi talks about love, suffering, all these ideas have come to him, as he himself says, from Christianity. Where the idea is not, doesn't remain separate. It becomes an infusion into your own culture. Or it can take the form of a synthesis something that Tagore was very fond of, and Gandhi often referred to it, where different cultures are brought together and synthesized, and there is a new product, which is not assimilation. Assimilation is higher. Or, at another level, it can also be cultural dialogue and take the form of integration. An idea is taken over and is given a distinct place in your own culture. So this dialogue can take many forms, but three are common, assimilation, synthesis or integration. But in all these cases, says Gandhi, the important thing is another culture should not be taken automatically as a norm, as an ideal, as a standard. And here he draws an extremely interesting distinction, which was also drawn by Arbindo. And there is a distinction between reform and change. That, in some sense, goes back to his early writings too. When he talks about Hindu Swaraj, in Gujarati he says, Sudaro. So in Gujarati, which is where it was written first, Sudaro means reform. And Gandhi is opposed to reform, but is all in favor of growth. And the reason is quite simple. He says the reformer is somebody who takes his idea from somewhere else uses it to judge his own culture and then condemns it for not conforming to the standard. So there's a beautiful uh, 
caricature, if you like, or a depiction of a Sudharak, of a reformer in Gandhi. When he thinks a Sudharak is Sudharak, a reformer, he's always lecturing to his own people, lecturing them, blackmailing them, blaming them. You idiots, why don't you improve? Why don't you do this? That's what a reformer does. By contrast, a person who changes, who wants to, his society to grow, would look at his own resources, point out to people the strength of his own society and how it can be mending, and in this way, he takes his individual, his society forward. Very good. So Gandhi says that in any intercultural dialogue or any intercultural borrowing, one should not think of another culture as a kind of standard, but as a pointing a direction, a thought, which suggests to you what in your culture needs changing and relying on your own resources to do that. So we have gone on too long, just to sum it up very briefly. What then is uh, Gandhi doing? in Swaraj, in ideas. Basically, what, what I have said can be summed up in the following way. As he said metaphysically, truth alone exists and ultimately prevails. Every individual, every society is constituted in a certain way and has his or its own truth. His freedom consists in discovering and living by its truth. That's why free speech is important, freedom is important, rights are important. And Swaraj is a way of discovering and living by one's own truth. So discovering one's own truth through talking, exchange of ideas, experiments with truth, because truth about oneself can't be discovered suddenly, so discovering Swaraj, truth about oneself, through experiments, through exchange of ideas, and then living according to it is what Swaraj is. It is not democracy in our sense, for all kinds of reasons, nor is it liberal liberalism, because liberalism is lumbered with the ideology of the individual and all that, which Gandhi's is not. Gandhi Swaraj, bears resemblance to, but is not liberal democracy. It doesn't have the individualism, happily, nor does it have the uh, uh, a kind of ethos, competition and all that, or the economy that goes with liberal democracy. It is a different kind of society. And to answer the question, which uh, Gita is very powerful pose, what is the takeaway? Well, I would say what is the takeaway is this idea that there is a kind of society possible which is beyond liberal democracy, which corrects the limitations of liberal democracy, and which can be based in Ghanaian way on truth. That I would suggest is one takeaway. There are several others. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture. Thank you, sir, uh, for your very insightful presentation. Uh, we'll take some questions after this. Uh, uh, but before that, we request uh, Professor Geeta Dharampal uh, if she has some observations to make on the lecture, which I thought was a very fascinating uh, take on the idea of freedom in a way we construe freedom today. So Professor D Geeta Dharampal, uh, would you elaborate on, on, on the discussion? Uh, so that we can open it uh, for the discussions for all the panelists. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. And thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Professor Bhikkhu Parekh. This was uh, a real treat, um, so eloquent and so um, discerning, but also balanced. And it was so accessible to um, both an Indian and a Western uh, audience in a way by uh, describing the different aspects of Swaraj, um, the being rooted in one's own tradition, 
but also being open to other uh, influences, other cultures, you were in a way squaring the circle. I think you did this uh, really wonderfully and in, um, in your, the few brush strokes that I made at the beginning, you really presented us with a beautiful, most uh, inspiring canvas. Um, and uh, I think that uh, in listening to you, I felt um, that I was in a way retracing what I had um, read from your um, previous books, um, Gandhi's political philosophy, colonialism, tradition and reform. Then of course, the very, very short introduction. All these books were part of my, um, uh, my training, my uh, knowledge about Gandhi, but they were also the set texts for my student at the uh, students at the University of Heidelberg. Um, they are very, very access accessible to students. I recommend them uh, to all the students who are listening today. Um, and I feel what you said about Gandhi uh, can perhaps be um, concretized by a quote that um, may be very, um, uh, very uh, uh, appro appropriately is in the Ney Talim Parisar, just outside, just uh, on the border of the Sevagram Ashram. Um, it's under a banyan tree, it says, and I think you, you will have maybe seen this yourself. Um, it says, I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stuffed. I want the culture of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible. But I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. And this last important sentence, I think is, is really important, but sometimes it's omitted from this quote. But I think we need to, after what we're hearing you, we have to uh, realize the significance of this, that, I, he, that Gandhi is firmly anchored in his own culture, but he can be inspired, receive uh, inspiration, stimulation from others. Um, I think this is very much uh, according to in line with the Hindu ethos as well, the uh, Indian modus vivendi, that is always uh, assimilating um, in a way, integrating, encompassing aspects from other cultures. Uh, but, and this is what makes Indian culture so multivalent, multidimensional. Um, and, but I think this, uh, uh, being able, being rooted in one's own culture is, as you said, it's part of uh, one's own self-realization. It is part of the Swadharma, the Swad Swaraj. Um, but it, you're rooted in one's, uh, in your own culture. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, it, it forms part of the, uh, realizing uh, uh, self, the process of self-realization, but it is accompanied by societal reform or change uh, and also self-purification or self-transformation, which one can do by being inspired also by other uh, cultures. Um, so I feel that this is in a way for Gandhi, it, perhaps it's not necessarily a tension it's in a way the existential logic of his understanding of uh, being uh, rooted in Indian culture, but having a universalist um, approach, universalist understanding, as um, I would say, this is not so uncommon in India. I think this is, the, in a way, he's, he's uh, participating in the general Indian ethos um, and, but we need to um, take into consideration what you have said, that um, being stimulated by another culture does not mean imitating. Uh, we, one should not blindly imitate. And this is what ha has perhaps happened um, rather too much in India that one imitates without really judging, without being judicious to see what, what, is, re uh, uh, what is appropriate for our, um, our specific needs. And that I think is very important for us to know. That is an important takeaway. Um, 
And I would also say that Gandhi, uh, uh, I mean, scholars on Gandhi have often emphasized the impact or the influence that um, Western writers, not necessarily part of the mainstream, uh, but writers like Thoreau, Ruskin, uh, Tolstoy, um, what impact they had on Gandhi. And I think uh, that is true. But what they said, in a way, struck an inner chord with Gandhi. It rang a bell and it made him realize the truth that he already knew intuitively. So when he's reading uh, other authors, he begins to understand um, his own culture even better. He, he becomes more consciously aware of it. And I think this happens also during his stay in London um, as a law student. He becomes in a way more consciously Indian. He becomes more consciously vegetarian. He becomes, uh, he, uh, dis, uh, he develops a, an interest in understanding um, his uh, the, uh, Hindu literature, the, his, under, his um, uh, work with the theos theosophists on translating the Bhagavad Gita. I mean, this, uh, this happens while he's in London. And the same process, I think, happens also in South Africa. Um, there, when he's um, in the same year where, um, uh, when uh, in Hind Swaraj is written in 1909, uh, the first biography about him is written uh, by uh, a Christian uh, pastor, Joseph Doak, and it's entitled M.K. Gandhi, an Indian patriot in South Africa. So this, this notion of his Indianness, although he's far away from the Indian subcontinent, he lived in South Africa for 22 years almost, um, that he, but he retains his, his Indianness and becomes more in a way more conscious of it and, and, and is, is examining it while he's in uh, another country and and I think this being in another country in a way um, uh, is uh, instigates him or is the incentive, gives him the in incentive to examine his own beliefs, his own practices. Um, and um, so one can uh, give more examples of this. I mean, for instance, his understanding of, of civil disobedience of Satyagraha, he says in, in, in Swaraj that, uh, that he knows of this, I think there's a, there's a quote from um, uh, from Hind Swaraj where he says, um, uh, when he's talking about civil disobedience, I remember an incident when in a small principality, the villagers were offended by some command issued by the prince. The former, the prince, immediately began vacating the village. The prince became nervous, apologized to his subjects and withdrew his command. Many such instances can be found in India. Real Swaraj is only possible where Satyagraha is the guiding force of the people and any other rule is foreign rule. So it's this notion of civil disobedience that was already being practiced in India, um, uh, but had then, this practice had become paralyzed due to uh, colonial rule. And Gandhi understands that this was there. He wants to regenerate it to make it, um, um, uh, to, make, to transform it into a modern political strategy. Um, and I think this, um, I mean, this notion that it, civil disobedience was uh, part of a, um, a citizen's moral right, um, a moral right to disobey to, against injustice. He brings this out and this is part of his understanding also of Swaraj and Swaraj in, in ideas. Um, and, and then um, what he's saying is also that um, the thoughts he has, um, they are dormant. They, are, they were thoughts that were dormant in the hearts of, of uh, the people and he's only given a voice to them. Uh, he's brought nothing new. I mean, he keeps on saying that uh, I have nothing new to teach the world, truth and nonviolence are as old as the hills. And uh, also what he's saying um, and what he's doing is considered, he considers it to be um, uh, something that belongs to, to the traditions of India, but he's 
re uh, regenerating it, bringing it, in, it into the political arena uh, so that it can be used. And the people also, that's why they react uh, in, with such, such enthusiasm. They see that he's talking our language. Um, I think this needs to be um, brought in with his understanding of Swaraj uh, in ideas and um, um, also his, his understanding of um, how this Swaraj can be uh, articulated in, in practice. I mean, he wants it to be a, a, a grassroots um, democracy where the power of the people is then emphasized. And he's talking about the oceanic circles rather than a pyramid with the, the, the central structure at the top and, and um, it, uh, power being um, um, and then uh, descending to the lower levels. It should come from the bottom, from the individual in the community, in the district, and, the, and then uh, in oceanic circles. Um, I think this, this is his notion of Swaraj, but it comes also from his from the notion of Swaraj uh, from an intellectual perspective, which is in a way determined uh, by uh, his understanding of um, uh, Indian practices, Indian traditions um, that he is giving new shape to, also because he has been influenced by other, other writings, other statements, other practices. And I think this also accounts for the, the great impact that Gandhi has then had uh, in the world. I mean, that he's been taken up by um, uh, the civil rights movement in the US, um, by the, the, the workers in um, Poland, uh, the Lech Walesa, Solidarność, uh, by Nelson Mandela. The, he, of course, it's this universalist appeal, but it, it's grounded, it's anchored within one's own tradition, and uh, traditions can share these. So this is, these are the thoughts that I had while you were speaking. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Parikh. Um, it's been a great inspiration to hear you. And um, uh, although just virtually to have this interaction with you, it's a, a really um, a, a very, very uh, special uh, opportunity for us and I, for all the audience um, indeed. But now maybe it's time for questions to come and then if there's anything I can add uh, uh, later. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Gita Ji. I think uh, definitely I think uh, uh, Professor Parekh has provoked us uh, uh, through his uh, today's presentation uh, on how uh, Suraj could work in the realm of ideas and the way he talks about uh, 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 moving away from uh, the whole idea of cultural conservatism uh, to cultural openness, I think is a takeaway uh, for all of us. But I'm sure uh, there are many uh, in the audience today uh, who might have some questions uh, to ask Professor Parekh. I could see many uh, very distinguished scholars from outside, Professor Faisal Devji, I could just see him here. Uh, and there are many, uh, Usaji is here from Mani Bhavan. So I could see, I could not name everybody, but I would like all to uh, come into this discussion and uh, perhaps a few questions can be addressed directly to uh, Professor uh, Bhikkhu Parekh and rest can be put up in the chat box also. So both ways it is possible to uh, have an interactive uh, discussion. For this, I will request Viprojit uh, 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 to conduct uh, this session uh, of the question and answer round. Back to Viprojit. Uh, Thank you, Viprojit. Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm uh, clearly audible. Uh, firstly, uh, it's an honor to be able to uh, moderate this session where we would uh, put questions to both our speakers and uh, get to know more about uh, the discourse or the ideas that we have been talking about till now. So uh, not taking much time, uh, this question uh, is an open question uh, for both our speakers and it's coming from Dr. Chandrika Kol, University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Uh, she asks that, uh, how do you engage with the views of others in India who have engaged with the ideas of Swaraj, but in contradistinction to Gandhi or in contrast to Gandhi, especially Tagore and Shubhas Chandra Bose? So 
the question basically talks about uh, how do you engage or how do you uh, take into consideration the uh, ideas of Swaraj that have been uh, talked about or uh, possessed uh, by uh, people in India apart from Gandhi and are in contradistinction to the idea of Swaraj that Gandhi possessed. Uh, for example, people like Tagore and Shabhash Chandra Bose. This is an open question for both of you. Whoever would like to uh, answer this first. Sir, ma'am. Professor Parekh, I'm, may I request you to kindly uh, address this question uh, first? Uh, sir, your microphone is on mute. Uh, if you can we unmute, uh, sir, please. Uh, can I request the host to unmute, sir? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. What was the question? Uh, sir, the question is, uh, in simple words, how does one engage with the views of others in India, for example, Rabindranath Tagore and Shabash Chandra Bose, who have had their own ideas of Swaraj, which might be in contradistinction to the idea of Swaraj that Gandhi had? Now, how does one engage? I mean, in various ways. Remember the way in which Gandhi engaged with Tagore. When Tagore's idea, I mean, Tagore had several occasions to write about it, and Gandhi responded to Tagore, uh, and, and, and vice versa. When Gandhi had said something, Tagore felt responsible for India, and he thought Gandhi was leading it in a mis wrong direction and intervened. So I think we engage in ideas by directly responding to them, starting a debate, and hoping that they will get you somewhere. Is there any other way? I any don't know. I don't that to uh, uh, certainly not in the way of a television does. Course, Marvin. Ma'am, do you have anything to add to that as well? Sorry? No. Uh, Gandhi, of, um, uh, of all the thinkers uh, and the uh, political thinkers of his. Uh, of his age was perhaps uh, the one who was talking in, in terms of a Swaraj in ideas. He was really, um, he was so rooted in um, the Indian ethos that I think he, um, although he, he does cite uh, other authors, uh, non-Indian authors, but he has, he has a intuitive understanding and he, he values also the, uh, this idea of self-realization uh, by referring to one's own um, roots to, to be able to then uh, understand others. Um, and I think uh, with uh, uh, Subhash Chandra Bhush, Rabindranath Tagore, the, um, there is, it's perhaps, it's not so intense and, um, Subhash Chandra Bosch is influenced by the political uh, allegiances and the political um, uh, affiliations at that time um, uh, in the global arena. Um, and of course, his understanding of violence is then also different to that of Gandhi's. And um, I think Tagore's understanding um, and um, uh, criticism of nationalism is also differs also to that of Gandhi's. Um, uh, Tagore is very critical about certain uh, campaigns of Gandhi and sort of the burning of the Khadi. Uh, he feels that this this is um, uh, or the burning of uh, British textiles rather um, is um, is not. Um, um, uh, is not appropriate for the, um, as an expression of one's own uh, identity and, um, in, and, and thinks that nationalism, um, even though Gandhi is uh, propagating this Swaraj in a nonviolent way, has a aggressiveness about it. Um, uh, th but this is, it's a complicated issue. So I think uh, uh, we need to 
discuss it in more detail, but maybe there are other questions and maybe we can come back to this um, in, while answering the other questions as well. Totally. Uh, so uh, following this, uh, I'd club two questions that have come in from uh, Meher Gandhi and Sonalika Rani. So firstly, Meher Gandhi asks that, uh, that is Swaraj completely definable in itself? Uh, she talks, uh, she gives a pretext as to uh, Swaraj as opposed to independence and a positive idea of silence, which was also uh, highlighted by Dr. Faisal Devji, or Professor Faisal Devji during his address. Uh, so is Swaraj as an idea opposed to independence or a positive idea of silence completely definable in itself? And following which, Sonalika Rani adds that if Swaraj is a way of life, can it be practiced outside the dominant uh, thought of Indian culture? Can it be practiced irrespective of culture or of any culture per se? Oh, well, you're absolutely right. Swaraj is a way of life. I, it's an important way of describing it. And Gandhi then goes on to explain what kind of way of life it represents. Yes, I agree. But uh, uh, the previous question that is it definable in itself when the context is set as to Swaraj as an idea opposed to independence or a positive idea of silence? Does it then uh, stand as something that is definable in itself or we have to uh, discover through it, through different contexts, the idea of Swaraj? When it's a positive idea, what do you have in mind? Pardon, sir? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. No, you were saying something about Swaraj as a positive idea and then asking me to explain what it meant. I'm asking you to tell me a bit more about what you have in mind. So, uh, what I have in mind is Swaraj for me is completely uh, an idea that can be defined in terms of Gandhi or it can be defined in terms of what you have said right now. But the question comes in uh, that we have received is I'll make it more simpler as to whether Swaraj as an idea is completely definable in itself or do we have to look at it through multiple spectrums in order to understand it better? So you, when you say definable in itself, I'm not entirely sure, but let's say, is it definable? And the answer is yes. I mean, the man tells you what it is. And it gets very complicated, but also very fascinating. Uh, if you look at it philosophically, Swaraj, now is, uh, first question is, how does Swar control ideas? What is Swar's relation to ideas? How do ideas create Swar? And what kinds of ideas would I recognize as our ideas as opposed to somebody else's idea? For example, take contemporary India. And you say, yes, we are all good Gandhians. We want to practice Swaraj. What ideas in the vast pool of ideas that circulate in India would you recognize as ours? Industrialization, well, it has become a part of our way of life. Any idea that you can think of has become a way of life for some sections of our people. And therefore, to specify our in the Gandhian way becomes rather difficult. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Ma'am Tarampal, do you have anything to add to uh, what sir has already established? Yes, I think um, uh, Professor Parikh had already um, gone into this, that Swaraj is different to independence, that independence was something more institutionalized, whereas Swaraj yeah. is, is a... Um, more ideas, is a more yeah, yes. Yeah, it's also a lived experience. It's philosophical. It's um, and um, so I think uh, Swaraj. But as as I also mentioned, Swaraj it doesn't. It's not some word that is coined by Gandhi. As I said, it goes back to Vedic uh, antiquity. Yeah, exactly. So um, it is. It is a part of the Indian uh, uh, political, uh, the Indian uh, polity um, and culture and and ethos um, and uh, it. It has been defined differently by different people in different contexts. But Swaraj, I think the one of the, the part of the question was also whether you could have Swaraj 
in other contexts other than India? Yes, of course you can. I mean, you can live according to your own um, uh, identity. You can realize, you have self-realization if you're living in, in Germany or in China or in America. It, it's not something that is just uh, um, uh, uh, contextually exclusive to India, but it is an Indian uh, formulation and uh, the translation as independence is, um, it's like with religion, you know, the, 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 you can't translate it one to one. So I, maybe that also explains, uh, answers your question partially. Thank you so much. Sarah. And also, I think there is a further question. There is a further question. Supposing you discover that an idea is yours, is it enough to act on it? It would be a lousy idea. Or you, you can say that this idea is not yours. It's not Swaraj. It comes from outside, therefore reject it. No, you borrow it. Similarly, when you arrive at a way of thinking, as Gandhi's case, he arrived at a body of ideas and called them Swaraj. Now many, some of us would say, look, this is all right for the Mahatma. It is not okay for us. So it should be possible for us to regard an idea as part of Swaraj, and yet not acceptable. Thank you so much sir, for that answer. I hope that has sufficed uh, the one a person who has asked the question. Uh, moving on, before we take another question from the set of questions that we have received, there might be people who have not been able to access the chat box as of yet. So I open uh, the floor for one direct question to either of the speakers or both of them per se. So if, do we have a direct question to uh, either of the speakers or both of them, a general question for both of them maybe? If not, we'll proceed with the set of questions that we have. Anyone would like to ask a direct question? Uh, yes, um, Madam uh, Mahe Gandhi, uh, you might pose your question. Um, so my question was, is Gandhi's idea of swa, as in the self roughly, definable without the um, existence of a para? Um, in that context, is his idea of swa um, a positive context, not the absence of a para, but a swa definable in itself? Is the question? Uh, Emma is not doing justice to you. I can only hear bits and pieces of what we have just seen. Could you be a bit more specific, please? Ms. Gandhi, I'd request you to be a bit louder if that's possible. Could you hear the question? Um, my question was Is Gandhi's idea of swerve roughly the self? understandable without the existence of a para? Um, and is it definable in and of itself? And in that context, is it a positive idea, not one defined by the absence of a para, but um, whole in itself? Well, Swaraj is certainly a positive idea in a way that independence is not. Because independence means not dependent on. Whereas Swaraj, then it's simply we doing things. It's not the absence of, it is the presence of. So in that sense, Saraj is a positive idea. The opposite of Saraj would be, as I said, colonialism, which can take many forms, where an outsider rules over you, and it's not Swar, but Parar Raja. So when an outsider rules over you, and takes the form of colonialism or imperialism or whatever, you don't have Swaraj. Thank you so much. I sir. think the word Swa needs more explication. I haven't had the time. Perhaps Giraji might be able to do that one day. But if you look at the history of the idea of Swa in our tradition, from the Vedas to the Gita to the Upanishad, Sve Sve Karmanya Birataha. Samsat Dinara Tedara, Sve Sve Karmanya Dinara. The whole idea of 
everyone caught up in doing his own dharma. The idea of swa is certainly Vedic, and it'll be useful to explore how it comes down to us and what form it takes at each stage in our history. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much uh, for that question, Ms. Gandhi. Uh, I've seen uh, hands being raised, uh, but I'm afraid we'll move on with the set of questions that we have already received. And if time permits, we'll take another direct question uh, for our speakers. Uh, next question that we move on to is from uh, Mr. Paul Mukherjee. The question says, in what way might the concept of Swaraj have relevance for a multicultural yet sharply divided and polarized countries such as the United States of America? That's a very clever question. Yeah. Very good question. In a multicultural society, Swaraj becomes quite important, but there are so many swords. There is a, a, not multicultural society per se, but a society in which there are deep divisions, a multicultural society in which cultural boundaries are very rigid. Well, there is there are several swirls. Take Canada. There is the Francophone Canada, there is the Anglophone Canada, there are at least two Canadas. If there is no single swirl, then there is a swaraj there, it becomes a difficult. India, by contrast, is different because all of our states share certain things in common, and there is an overarching unity of a certain kind, at least a cultural unity. And when there is this kind of unity, it becomes easier to talk about Swaraj. Now, in a multicultural society of the kind that this young man talks about, Swaraj doesn't exist, but it can be created. Because in any kind of society, you can bring people together and create situations in which they interact and create a single collective we. Ma'am, would you like to uh, add to what Sir has already established? Uh... Yeah, I think along with the swa and the, the swadharm and the swabhav and swaraj, yeah. uh, is also the notion of of uh, the acceptance of the other as the other and the respect of the other, and uh, this is in a way uh, also the practice of nonviolence, as Gandhi would say. Um, so, uh, if you have that in a society, in a multicultural society. Um, where you accept the otherness of the other or you respect the otherness of the other, um, it can, can work. But if there is a, uh, an, uh, in a society, a multicultural society, where the, the emphasis is on the individual, on asserting one's individual, uh, you know, be, being a self-made man, uh, uh, as the ethos of the U.S. is, um, and uh, the way the U.S. has then emerged, you know, th also through violence, um, there there are certain difficulties. There, the the divisions become then uh, problematic, and um, uh, and especially if the emphasis isn't on nonviolence, as Gandhi uh, would have uh, emphasized, and I think um, I, as he he saw as the the um, the kind of modus vivendi of living in a community. I mean, he he saw this the the that the swa, swaraj and the swadharm could could be realized more fully in a sort of decentralized in a community in the, the um, uh, 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 context rather than from the point of view of the nation state, a centralized state, um, and um, so. There, there is, there would be a problem perhaps in modern um, national, um, even liberal democracies, um, how, how to realize the multiculturalism of, uh, and how different cultures can live to the fullest, can, can realize themselves to the fullest without um, intruding on the others. If one doesn't have this, this uh, inbuilt. I mean, it's sort of it's 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 a uh, it's an instinctive understanding of respect for the other, rather than something that is being imposed by uh, laws or a constitutional um, ethos. Um, and Gandhi would say that this is something that is 
is the intu intuitive, the, the way of living, the modus vivendi of living that you respect others. Uh, and this may not be so um, inherent uh, or integral to um, multicultural societies like the US. Thank you so much ma'am, for your address as well on the or your take on the question as well uh, we'll move uh, we'll quickly move over to the next question which uh, is a question particularly uh, directed to professor parik uh, the question reads uh, that uh, can gandhi be called as an activist type of mystic especially in his ideas on religion and conversion like one finds in medieval india an activist type of mystic. Given, given, given on the lines of his ideas on religion and conversion. I wouldn't call him a mystic. He's an activist, but activist type of something else, but not that of a mystic. I'd request you to uh, maybe uh, talk about that activist type of something and uh, maybe elaborate on the something, if not activist a mystic. Thing. He's an activist uh, saint, as he said once, or he's an activist, full stop, a political activist, a religious person who became active because of the compulsion of religion. Because when he was told that, look, people say keep religion and politics separate, he said, those who say that don't understand what religion is about, because my religion compels me to take part in politics. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, then again, uh, we have a question that is quite relevant to today. It's coming from Miss Aisha. That uh, how can we convince or influence today's youth to? How can we what? Uh, how can we convince or influence today's youth to follow up the path of Gandhian philosophy or to adopt the path of Gandhian philosophy? given that today's youth is very impulsive and that the belief in non-violence might not be uh, something that uh, appeals to them. Yes, now here the question would be, there are young people, they are trying to convince him of something, convince them of something. Well, whether you succeed or not depends on how cleverly you argue and how you are able to persuade them. Now, I would simply say, look, you can uh, talk to young people, and if your ideas have potency and some relevance to the age, they will be heard. Other ideas will be discarded. In Gandhi's case, if you went and told young people, look, observe celibacy, that is the source of strength, they would say, look, I'm sorry, you know, it's all right for an old man of 70, but not for young man of 25. But if we went and talked about other things that Mahatma was talking about, you know, openness to other cultures, um, Gita was saying cultural free winds coming in through the windows, Ano, Bhadra, Kratavo, Yantra, Vishwataha, then people might be more responsive to that. Depending on what we have to sell and how you sell it. And there is no reason why our people should necessarily buy Gandhi. I mean, just because Gandhi was an Indian, doesn't mean that Indians should follow him. Hmm? I, I, this question would uh, maybe uh, let you uh, build up on what you have established till now. This question has come from uh, Mr. Anshul Sharma. The person asks, how far is it possible for an individual to live like Gandhi, living an experimental life, and then being progressively courteous, responsible, and people-centric in approach. Oh, and individuals can live very different, anywhere they like. Uh, and in India, we have all kinds of people uh, who lead different kinds of life. Gandhian kind of life is one, and there are people who try to live that kind of life too, except that they may not be very successful politicians. That's what I was saying. I would just like to add that um, 
uh, Gandhi um, uh, once very st stated very explicitly that he didn't want a cult built around him. Right, exactly. Because in uh, 1940, um, February 1940, at a Gandhi Seva Sangh meeting, he says, I, uh, I don't want to uh, have followers. Um, we are all co-workers. Um, there's no leaders. You know, what I have done, I've just done experiments uh, with as best as I could. But uh, I, he, he even says, I did not create a sect. I did not belong to any sect. I've never dreamt of establishing any sect. And if any sect is established in my name after my death, my soul would cry out in anguish. Mm -hmm. So this is very explicit. I mean, I think sometimes one is you making a cult out of Gandhi, you know, and uh, in a way um, stereotyping him, um, which he didn't himself want. He says that he wasn't a leader. He's he's just a co-worker, and that people should should follow their their swadharm, their their own inclinations with using uh, truth, non-violence as their their load stars. I mean, that's what he, he did. But um, uh, one, and it was experiments that he was doing. So uh, we can all make experiments, we can fail. I mean, he also failed at times, but you recognize the failure and um, continue. I mean, life is a continual process of learning. And I think uh, for the youth, if we can de-fetishize Gandhi, you know, one has this thing, um, there's a very, um, uh, I mean, this notion of the three monkeys, you know, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. And then there's a cartoon saying that with Gandhi, uh, with Gandhi and the three monkeys, and Gandhi sitting there with, with a computer, and they said, nobody said anything about blogging. <laughs> so, you know, one can uh, blog, um, and then there's another one, another cartoon of Gandhi sitting with Nehru, um, saying that uh, if we had uh, this uh, Facebook and that uh, in our times, that Gandhi would have been the blogger of the nation, you know, <laughs> rather than being the father of the nation, he could be the blogger of the nation. And I think uh, this th this sort of uh, trying to um, uh, remove the straitjacket from Gandhi, you know, as, as a saint, as a Mahatma on a pedestal. But he's a, he's a man who's always uh, experimented, trying. He's a hands-on politician. He's also, in a way, a Satyagrahi scientist. I, he, he's he's uh, trying out new things, uh, also one, wanting the best kind of uh, tool to work with, the best kind of charka, whatever. Huh? Um, so I think we could do this now. I mean, what he's doing with the constructive program, in a way, it's a sort of pan-Indian start. <laughs> uh, so um, I think one can make Gandhi more um, accessible to the youth by uh, de-fetishizing him. And um, uh, there, uh, I don't know whether we have time now. I, I had a few cartoons of this. Maybe we can just show... Um, if the questions come, where it may take a little while to, to get uh, uh, this, uh, this, this is. What happened? We are closing the meeting. Uh, this. No, uh, Can you see it? Yes. Aha, right. Can you see the cartoon? No, I see the cartoon, yes. Yes. Yeah, that, yes. So no one said anything about blogging with <laughs> uh, um, the three. Yes. Fine. I see. So, uh, yeah, it's great. This one. About, this is Gandhi and Nehru sitting in the cloud with it to unite the nation. And Nehru saying to Gandhi, and you would be uh, fondly called blogger of the nation. Huh? <laughs> so, um, yes, maybe one, one needs to um, sort of make Gandhi come alive in a way. Um,
but again uh, the this um, the youth that shouldn't shouldn't feel that they have to you know lead a celibate life uh, always be nonviolent um, uh, for, go on fasts I mean uh, to be Gandhi you know, that that is not what Gandhi was uh, was uh, saying or what he this was in a specific context and I think we have to be true to ourselves I mean well, I suppose he's the only politician on whom there has been a book of cartoons. There have been more cartoons on Gandhi. Yes. His face, nose, his ears, one part or another of his body. The cartoon is love. Charkha. Yes. I have a, I have a book published by Navjivan called Gandhi in Cartoons. Yes, yes, right. Yeah, I, I've seen that too. Yes, it's very good. Yeah. Very good. From the time yeah. in South Africa. Yes, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So. And he loved those cartoons. Yeah, they are. He liked them. Mm, right? Yes. When those yeah. cartoons were made in times of India, Hindustan times, Gandhi looked at them and he loved them. Yeah, aha. Uh -huh. He was never offended. Yes. Uh, well, thank you, young man. So, thank you. Hmm? Thank you, Gitaji. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just a second, sir. I think maybe if we can spare a few more minutes because I think there are some few questions uh, to be addressed. Maybe five minutes also we can all that we can take now. Uh, I know we are overrunning time. Okay, now uh, we'll take five minutes. Sure. No yeah, problem. please, please, sir. There's a last yeah. question uh, that uh, to Professor Parikh. Uh, last question from Ms. Jane. Uh, the question is simple. Uh, wouldn't it be true to say that as India is a much older country in terms of a long assimilation of different peoples or cultures and religions, then younger countries such as US and Canada have a long way to go? So in that context, uh, would you care to explain uh, the idea of... Uh, uh, Suraj or Gandhi in terms of the India being a much older country in terms of in, in comparison with younger countries such as US and Canada? No, in view of the fact that India is an older country, older in what sense? Because at one level it's a younger country. You know, the proportion of young people under 25 is one of the highest in India, in the whole world. But if you mean the history, historically, then I would say India is oldest, but then there was no India. Was there India in the 13th century, 10th century, 5th century? You had principalities, you had kingdoms, republics, but there was no India. So I would question the assumption behind the question. Then let's say we'll uh, keep that for another day of discussion because uh, we are running short of time. I'd. Uh, invite uh, our convener, Doc, Dr. Sanjeev, to please conclude today's wonderful discussion and uh, extend a gratuitous vote of thanks. Sanjeev, sir, may you please? Yeah, uh, so thank you, Bipurajit, uh, and thank you, Professor Parekh and Professor Geeta Dharampal, uh, for this lovely evening. Uh, I think uh, probably all of us here, uh, we have been richly uh, benefited through this discussion. and. Uh, and of course, uh, we thought that the, if there was some more time, uh, then probably many more could have uh, joined this discussion. But thank you once again, uh, Professor uh, Parekh, for your very insightful and thought-provoking presentation. Uh, when we see the changing world and the multiple challenges uh, that we confront today, uh, we know how crucial Gandhi becomes uh, and has definitely solutions to perhaps many of our modern predicaments. Uh, but it is also true uh, that much of Gandhi's ideals and praxis uh, has been reduced to frayed uh, symbolism. Uh, thus, it is important that we engage him in a way that do not uh, reduce him uh, uh, to mere rituals and textual figures uh, that unfortunately uh, has become a norm today. Uh, uh, we thank you, Professor Parekh, uh, for uh, sparing your invaluable time for the webinar. Uh, despite your uh, pressing engagements. Uh, we look forward uh, to have you in our future engagement hours. And also, I would like to personally thank you uh, for the inputs that you gave uh, for the book that I published uh, through Richlet recently. So thank you so much for that also, uh, for the forward that you uh, gave for us. Uh, 
for the enriching discussion uh, uh, with her critical insights and knowledge on the subject. Uh, I thank uh, Professor Geeta Dharampal. It was a pleasure having you as a chair and also being a collaborative partner in this initiative. Uh, we look forward uh, to the opportunities uh, of working together uh, with Gandhi Research Foundation and learning much uh, from your experience uh, and wisdom uh, in near future. Mm. I'm thankful uh, to our principal, uh, Professor Baig, who unfortunately could not uh, join in because of some personal reasons, uh, but he has been there supporting all our academic and other curricular activities. Uh, much of the pain in organizing uh, this initiative has been taken uh, by a dedicated team of uh, student volunteers of Gandhi Study Circle. Uh, uh, Sakshi, Aarti, Biprajit, who just moderated this session, uh, as you could have seen, uh, Tushar, Zoya, Samir, uh, Satyarth, Karan, uh, Sueba, Ankit, Ishani, Aditi, uh, Nasif, Kalpita, Karan, and many others, I think they constitute our important pillar. Uh, and deserve special mention. In Dr. Shavana and Dr. Tripta, uh, uh, they find valuable uh, guidance and support. Uh, for much of the technical support, I thank Dr. Shonu Trivedi, uh, who helped us uh, to conduct this event. Uh, many distinguished scholars, uh, colleagues, and guests uh, joined this event uh, from different parts of the country and abroad. Uh, we thank you all uh, for joining us today. Uh, we are truly uh, benefited from the rich discussion uh, that followed through the lecture. And for this, I thank all the participants and students who also joined this proceeding. Uh, the success of this event will motivate us uh, to carry such initiatives uh, with your cooperation and support. I look forward uh, to seeing you all uh, in next series of lecture that we plan to have in near future. Uh, thank you, Professor Parekh and Professor Geeta Dharampal uh, for your very generous support. Uh, thank you all. Uh, the session uh, concludes now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, you, thank, you. thank you for organizing this and making Sorry. it possible for me to meet Geeta Ji and to get some feel of the audience. Uh, I hope it goes well, the subsequent session. And I uh, congratulate you once again on your book, which it has been a privilege to read. Thank you so much. It has been my, my pleasure, sir. And of course, Professor Geeta Ji, I look forward uh, to your constant encouragement and support. Thank you all. And thank you, audience, uh, for making this day a great success. Thank you all. I look forward to have you in your future. Thank you very thank you. much from me. It was 